Awesome job, guys. And again, thanks so much to Brett and Kelly and Hansel and Steve for the great way they work together. And, uh, you know, we're not still in the worship team. Uh, they may come from time to time and play with us. But Kelly, I want to say special thanks to Stephen Ansel. These guys are really special, and I know you guys know that. Uh, but we've had uh, many years leading worship um, at different churches, and of course, Kelly and I have been married 10 years, but both of us were leading worship for 20 plus years before we got married. And this has been unique and special. And Ansel and Steve have made it really easy. Um, just say, just saying thank you to the Lord for their gifts, but thank you to them for their time and their their gifts. So thanks, thanks again. Thank you. I'm going to take just a minute or so to try to get everyone on the same page with my physical condition, okay? Because I know people have different understandings about what's going on. It's really very simple. There are two situations. One is my back has gone out again, and uh, from the way it sounds, it's probably a little worse than it was before I had surgery the first time. So that's not really good. But uh, that's something that will uh, maybe be taken care of over time by injections, or it may require surgery. I'm not sure which way, but that's the back issue, okay? The other, I have two um, tumors in my small intestine, and uh, so the doctor is dealing with uh, very carefully and very cautiously on that. Uh, in terms of determining whether uh, it's cancer or not cancer. They're, they're already running tests for all of that, then ultimately they'll have a biopsy. And uh, so depending on what that says will depend then on what they do in terms of, of the surgery or uh, radiation or chemo or whatever might be required or not be required that way. Right now we don't, we don't have any idea what it is. Uh, most likely it will be benign and we'll just pass on through and it was just a little bump in the road. Uh, if it's not, it's still just going to be a little bump in the road, okay? Amen. Uh, God's in charge of it. Uh, the way he led us to find it out is great encouragement because it, it to, to the world it was a coincidence and to us we knew that, that it was God and uh, and so he knows what he's doing he's got a plan and it's going to be uh, just as we're saying in the song he causes all things to work together for good uh, to them that love the Lord and call according to his purpose so that's my story I'm sticking to it uh, and hopefully everybody's sort of on the same page now uh, I, I know there's been some confusion since there was two different things going on at the same time and, and hard to uh, maybe get in your head straight exactly what was what. Janice, I had your spray setting out, oh. <laughs> ready to pick up this morning. <clears throat> I got dressed in the dark and walked out without it. <clears throat> <laughs> we'll so, have a backup one here. <laughs> <clears throat> Hopefully I won't dry out too bad here. We're, this morning we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verses 25 through 28. We're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. In your Bible, you can follow along with me. We'll begin with verse 25. If not, you can follow on the screen. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 25. Paul, of course, is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We closed our last study with Paul instructing us as Christians to put on the new self. And uh, the way we saw that literally uh, in the Greek New Testament would be put on the new man or as it would be in the case of a woman, put on the new 
woman, from the new person that you are. Now the last characteristic of the new man that Paul spoke of in the previous verses was truth. So he's talking about putting on truth. Now, he uses the word therefore here to connect the truth of verse 24 with the practical way that we're to put that truth on in verse 25. And that practical way that we're to put truth on is to lay aside falsehood. <coughs> so that's really not rocket science to, to think that through and to realize if we're speaking falsehood <coughs> and we lay that aside, then what's going to be left? We're going to be speaking truth. So this is this is what he's saying here by bringing these two together. Now, the, the falsehood he's speaking of here is really lies or lying. Okay? Now, uh, he's instructing us then as believers to stop lying and start telling the truth. That's not too hard to understand. And it shouldn't be too hard for us to think that God would require that of us as his children since uh, he is truth then he would have us in his every way possible to be walking in truth now this quote comes from Zechariah 8 verse 16 and uh, folks points out something very interesting when you look at Zechariah's passage in the Old Testament and you look at what is translated here in the New Testament then you realize that the preposition to is rendered here with the word with. Okay? Locke says that that brings more closeness in union of one to the other. Changing out to to uh, with and causing us to be seen as closer together as man to man in that situation. Now when Paul says, for we are members of one another, it becomes clear that he's referring to us as Christians that make up the church, the body of Christ. We're members of one another. We can't say that about people in general out in the world. You can't say that lost people are members one of another. But you can say that Christians are members one of another because we are members of the body of Christ the church throughout the world. Now Romans 12, uh, 5 makes this so when it says, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Thus Paul is showing us that Christians are to be truthful with each other. Now that's not saying that it's acceptable for us as Christians to lie to non-Christians. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's not an out there, okay? Uh, <laughs> but it, it, is, it is indicating that we are to be truthful to one another. And God would want us to be just as truthful to the lost as He would to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And the reason why He only mentions the connection with, between brothers and sisters in Christ is because that's what He's dealing with specifically here. And because that's left out about how we're to deal with non-Christians doesn't give us that opportunity to say, okay, I can show here in Scripture where I can tell lies to people that are not Christians. How easy would that be, okay? Now, many people in our society fail to place an emphasis on what we're talking about here. Many would fail to place an emphasis on speaking the truth. Okay? But at the same time, there are many who would not make a big deal of lying. And I think I shared a statistic several years ago with you that a study was done with teenagers. They had a group that was teenagers who went to their teenage youth group at their church every week. And so they were at church on Sunday morning with their family. They were at church on Sunday night. They were at church one night during the week in their youth group. They took another group that was the same age, teenagers, 16, 17, 18 years old, and they did the same study with them. 
And what they came out and found out was that 96% of the kids in the Christian youth group lied. Whereas 100% of the kids that were not Christians in the youth group lied. Now, that's a serious, serious problem in the church. If the church is not presenting the fact of the importance of the truth, and it's not being taken seriously any more than that, then the church is in trouble. Uh, and, and, and we're raising up a bunch of liars, if that's the case. And it's a sad thing. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there are many who are Christians who lie continuously. And uh, sometimes I think it's easier for people, uh, it would be easier to tell the truth than it would to tell a lie. And yet some people will still tell a lie when they could have told the truth. And uh, people slough it off. Well, just a little white lie. What does that matter? There's no such thing as a white lie or a black lie. That There's only one lie. Okay? You have no half-truth if it's a half-truth that's a whole lie. There's, there's no in-between with this. There's no black and white with this. Either we're lying about something or we're telling the truth about something. And uh, as Christians, we're expected to speak the truth. <clears throat> and it is important for us to realize what the Scripture says to people who are liars. This needs to be understood. The scripture says liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a harsh statement. That's a broad statement. Okay? And so that should say to us uh, something about how important it is for us to be truthful in every aspect of our lives. Whether we're talking to the lost or talking to the saved. Therefore, as believers, we're to stop lying to one another and begin speaking the truth to our Christian brothers and sisters as well as all others that we come into contact with. Now verse 26. He says, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Here Paul quotes from Psalms 4.4. Now, he's not advocating getting angry here when he says, be angry. Okay? <laughs> sort of another thing, just like the last verse, you know. You can't read something into this and say, okay, it says right here, get angry. Okay, the Bible says do it. Uh, it's, it's not saying that. It's not advocating anger. But he's saying that when and if we do become angry, we're not to allow it to become sin. So there's a point in time in which becoming angry is not a sin. Yet there's another point in time in which becoming angry has gone too far and it has become a sin. Thus we see that it is possible to be angry and yet not sin. It all has to do with the length of time we allow the anger to remain. Anger dealt with before the sun goes down is not sinful. Okay? However, anger that is not properly dealt with before dark, okay, becomes sin. If you get angry with someone early in the morning and you let that continue and you let it continue later in the afternoon, God leads you to make that right, then you have not sinned by becoming angry. But if for whatever reason you choose to not make that right with that person before dark, then it has become a sin. And we're going to talk in a moment uh, about how serious that can be in a person's life. So one might ask the question, why is it so important to not let anger turn into a sin. You say, well, so it wouldn't be a sin. But there's something beyond that that is important for us to not let anger turn into a sin. And verse 27 is the answer to that question. It says, and do not give the devil 
an opportunity. Here Paul uh, <clears throat> points out something that is very important. Do not uh, give the devil an opportunity, literally in the Greek, is do not give the devil a place. Do not give the devil a place. When one becomes angry and fails to deal with it quickly enough, it gives the devil and demons a place in the life of that person who has become angry. Now this is a literal fact of life. The devil and his demons can enter the lives both of believers and non-believers. And it is spoken of as they enter and begin their operation in a person's life. It is spoken of as having a demonic stronghold in that particular area. Now, if we have the demon spirit of anger that has come against us and we've become angry and we do not deal with that anger before the sun goes down and uh, we don't deal with it until sometime later. Even if it's midnight, <laughs> you've still crossed the line, okay? Uh, but there, there's the anger that is there and is present. And it becomes a sin in our life. But what is worse is that because that anger has gained a foothold or a stronghold, or literally in the Greek, a place in that person's life, then that means that that anger is going to seek to bring its relatives into that person's life also. Uh, <clears throat> demonic spirits like to travel and go in families. If one enters a person's life, then that one is going to seek to do everything possible to bring all the other demonic spirits that are related to that particular spirit. And if you're not aware of that, this is a, a, a truth. Demonic spirits group together. And they have related groups. Okay? And so, if you have the spirit of anger that is not dealt with, that spirit comes and takes a place in that person's life, then there is this, the stronghold then of anger. Now, that stronghold will grow because that demonic spirit will work to bring unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, revenge, outburst of temper, violence, hatred, murder, and other demonic spirits to come in and, and be in that stronghold together. And before you know it, a simple matter of not dealing with anger has a person in a situation that there is a stronghold, there is a bulkhead there in which there's a whole family of demonic spirits that are now able to influence that person's life. And you say, well, how in the world can you say that a, a demon spirit can come into a Christian's life? How can the Spirit of God and the spirit of a demon be in a Christian at the same time? Well, a lot of people say that that is impossible. But it's not impossible. It, it, it is something that happens all the time. And it, it is, is something that the enemy works at to bring to pass in our life all the time. Nothing would make him happier than to bring in uh, a certain spirit and then that spirit began to bring in more spirits and create one of those families in our lives as Christians. So we must understand, just being a Christian does not automatically guard against a demonic spirit taking up residence and bringing other demonic spirits into your or my Christian life. And so this is why it's so important for us to not let the sun go down on our anger. Because you can bet on this. The devil is not going to miss that opportunity. You let the sun go down on your anger, and the devil is going to take up a place in your life. You say, well, 
That's not fair because that person did me wrong. It doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with fairness or whether they were right or wrong. It has everything to do with what you are going to allow to happen. Okay? So, this is, this is really important and uh, it's something that must be taken seriously. Now, look at verse 28. Okay, I'll finally get there. These pages that have been handled so much, they stick together. Pitiful, pitiful condition of my Bible here. <laughs> okay, now, verse 28. He says, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Very plainly, Paul is saying that the new believer who had been a thief before their salvation experience should now get a job and quit stealing. Okay? Quit living off of being a thief. Okay? Get a real job. Stop stealing. Now, the Greek word translated labor here refers to labor which is toiling and working hard with a person's hands and doing good and performing good with their hands. So uh, that was much, very much the case in that day and time. In most cases, any labor, any work that anyone did in Paul's day and time was something that was very, uh, a very manual labor kind of a situation. Not always the case in our society today. Uh, our job may not cause us to, to have to do manual labor or whatever. But it's talking here about working hard at what you're working at and stop stealing, get a job, and, and earn a living. Now, this work is not just to be done to benefit the person who does the work and the person's family who does the work. Instead, it is to go beyond that and it is to bring that person to a position in life that they're working, they're able to take care of themselves and their family, but at the same time, they're making enough money and putting aside enough money that when they run into someone that's in need, they can go to wherever it is they have their little stash and they can pull money out and they can help the person that God brings across their path that is in need. And so this is the purpose here. It is not that we're to earn a living selfishly for ourselves. That's important because that means if we're not, we're either stealing, like it says here, or someone else is having to take care of us. Okay? Either way, God wants us to take care of ourselves. He wants us to take care of our own. And He also wants us to have enough that we can share with those who are in need around us. Now, <clears throat> the preachers of the prosperity gospel teach and lead people to give in order to get back in return. You know, it's that, hey, God told me on the way to the station here that if you will give $58, you know, $5,800 will be brought to you within 90 days. You know, you've heard all of those things. And that's, that's what they tell you. They tell you you're to give in order to get. And uh, many of them go so far as to say that you're stupid if you don't give in that fashion. One guy has a song. He's written. <laughs> How stupid thou art. You know, he goes along with this song uh, along the lines of... of uh, song that that's the word how, how, how what how great how great thou art yeah and, and and he makes fun he makes fun and sings this little song he's put together saying how stupid a, a christian is that does not give with the full motivation of giving in order to get more back never out of a heart of how christians are supposed to give like maybe it's in obedience to god okay 
like maybe it would be out of love for others who are in need. You know, like maybe it would be to help advance the kingdom of God in the world. You see the difference in, in these things? There's a, there's a vast difference. So there's, there's a way that we're to give. And uh, the, the bottom line is when we give, we do get back. But that should not be our, our sole motivation uh, for giving. Now, <clears throat> we're going to close with this verse. And before we uh, take the Lord's Supper, I wanted to deal with wrapping this verse up, or these verses up, by simply asking a few questions, okay? And I want you to just think about these questions as they're asked. And then I believe God will be able to speak to you in terms of uh, what it is you need to gain uh, from having been here this morning and heard the Word of God taught. First of all, are you a born-again Christian? That's bottom line, basic. That should be presented to every group of people that ever gather in a church on Sunday morning. Whether the, whether the message is uh, an evangelical message or whether it's a doctrinal message or whatever it may be, there needs to be an awareness that, that a person needs to be born again through turning from sin and faith in Jesus Christ that that's the only way that they can be made right with God. So if you've not made that commitment in your life, then let me say to you, you need to do so today. Secondly, as a believer, do you always seek to speak the truth? Now be honest with yourself. You didn't get that. As a believer, do you always seek to speak the truth? Be honest with yourself. <laughs> okay. If you're not speaking the truth and seeking in every situation with every person to speak the truth, then you need to recognize that and by the power of the Holy Spirit in your Christian life, you need to begin to do that. Because there are no lies of any kind that are acceptable. Okay? Thirdly, as a believer, do you deal properly with anger? Is there anger in your heart towards someone now that's way past before the sun goes down? If that's the case, then you really need to take this message seriously. Because I promise you, if it's there, demonic spirits of anger and their relatives are also there. You say, well, I'm not aware of that. Well, that's their job, to work in your life and you not be aware of it. People around you might say, I'm aware of it. <laughs> I can see it. And I can name the spirits that are there. Okay? So this is a serious matter. And you need to deal, deal with it. If you're not dealing properly with anger, I don't care who it's toward, I don't care what they've done to you. God is saying to you today, today's the end. It's time to deal with this and get it right. And He will lovingly, by His Spirit, help you step by step go through what you need to go through to get your heart and mind right in this issue. Fourth, does the enemy have a stronghold in your life? Now, that goes back to what I just said as an example of, of anger. If you have anger that has gone past the point of, of properly dealing with, then you have at least one stronghold in your life. And it will be anger and ever how many other spirits related to anger he's been able to bring in to this point in time. And uh, this is a demonic stronghold. And, uh, and again, this is something that you need to recognize. If it's present, you need to take action to deal with ridding yourself from it. Okay? And if repenting 
And renouncing that spirit and the other spirits that are related to it does not work for you, then you may need to go to a, another Christian and ask them to pray for you concerning uh, the spirit that might be present. And our ministry team over here this morning will be uh, exactly the place you need to go to. If you're facing such a situation. Now, another question, number five. Are you a baptized believer? There are people who have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, but they've never been obedient to God and followed in water baptism. So I would say to you this morning, if you're, if you're born again, you've not been water baptized, you're walking in disobedience to Christ. And He wants very much for you to recognize that and come to the place that you would publicly profess Him before others in the act of water baptism by immersion as a believer. I would love to talk to you about that if you're in that situation and have questions. Number six, do you steal from other people? All of you know my history of thievery. I think it was 1969. I stole the front wheels and tires off of a brand new Mustang. And I didn't even steal them for myself. I was stealing them for a knucklehead I was riding with who had bad tires. And uh, we ran, it, ran out on the last one, and we still were not back to Norfolk for our ship. And, uh, and so we pulled up at this place that was a, uh, a public uh, phone in this parking area. And he pulled up to it, and he told me and the other guy in the back seat, get out and go steal the tires off that car over there. And I'll sit here like I'm talking on the phone, so if the police come by, you know, it won't look like something wrong is going on here. And I was stupid enough, I got out and did it. <laughs> <coughs> Brand new Mustang just set it down on the ground in the front. <laughs> that was my experience of stealing. But I'm serious. There are Christian people that steal on a regular basis. And we've got to face this fact and, and, and ask ourselves honestly. There are a lot of different ways to steal. You know, a lot of different ways. And if you, you think, you can probably think up several of those. But the thing we need to do is not steal from other people. But now listen to this carefully. The Bible presents a fact in which it is possible to steal from God Himself. It's pretty bad for me to steal a guy's wheels and tires off of his new car. That's bad. But it's even worse when I steal from God. You say, how in the world can someone steal from God? And that's the answer that was, the question that was asked in the book of Malachi. And God turns around immediately and says simply this, by not bringing the tithe into the storehouse. Now, I don't teach on money a lot. But it's here. I'm going to teach on it today. And I'm going to say without doubt or question, in my understanding of Scripture, if you are not bringing 10% of what God blesses you with into the church, the storehouse, the place where you're spiritually fed, then you are robbing from God. And this morning, God would have you stop stealing from other people and would have you to make a commitment that you stop stealing from God. And you say, I can't afford to tithe. The absolute truth, it's, a, it's an old cliche, but it is absolute truth. You cannot afford to not tithe. 
because the enemy will take more away from you because of your disobedience to God than the tithe that you give him in obedience. Understand what I'm saying? If God wants 10% and you fail to give it, the enemy in all of his different ways is going to rob from you 12, 13, 14, 15, 25, 30%, whatever amount he can get by with. And that is an absolute biblical truth. And that is an absolute biblical experience by many of the people sitting here right now. I can see their heads going up and down. They've learned the lesson that you can't rob from God and get by with it. He's going to allow the devil to rob from you. And as I said, he'll allow the devil to take more away from you than the tithe that he wants to receive from you. So 10% of whatever God blesses you with, it belongs to God. And it needs to be brought to the place that you worship. <clears throat> and then that money needs to be used in that, lo in that local church in the way that would be pleasing to God. And if you find yourself in a local church that's not using the money the way you think is pleasing to you, then find a church that does. Don't just say, well, I'm not going to give to that church because I don't like what it does with its money. No, you're not giving to that church. You're giving to God. If that church is not using it like you think it should be used, find you one that does. Okay? And be faithful to give it there. Now, number seven. <clears throat> what is your motive for giving? Is it giving in order to get? Like the, uh, uh, the television evangelist teach it? Uh, you know, Name it, claim it, that sort of thing. Prosperity message, that sort of thing. Is that your motive for giving? If it is, it needs to change. You need to become aware of it, and you need to turn from that. And your motive to give should be, listen to this carefully, it should be to get so that you can have more to give. <clears throat> Let me say that again. Giving to get is wrong. Giving to get in order to give is right. And that's what each of us as Christians should have as our, 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 our motive for giving. Now, at the close of the service, you're going to have an opportunity to make any commitments that God is showing you you need to make this morning. Get any prayer that you need to make this morning or have this morning because the ministry team will be over here at the close of the service. But we're going to take communion first. And don't let this change in action here stop you from making the decision that God is leading you to make now that you're aware of. Or go in prayer for what you're aware of now you need prayer for. Don't let, don't let it get off your mind and walk out of here and say, well, I'm not thinking about it anymore. Do what's on your heart now because God has placed it there. And it will only be a blessing to you for you to uh, <clears throat> do what he's leading you to do. Now, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> before we have that opportunity of, of prayer time and commitment, we want to take communion. Uh, many call it the Lord's Supper. Some call it communion. Both, both the same event. Uh, and I would remind you that, first of all, <clears throat> taking the Lord's Supper does not cause anyone to be saved. Okay? If you are not a Christian, and you think, well, I want to become a Christian, so I'll take the Lord's Supper today. Now I'll become a Christian. That It doesn't work that way. Okay? Uh, so don't make that mistake in thinking that's the way you get saved. We spoke earlier of the way you get saved. Now, on the other side of that, and hear me very clearly on this, this is very important. If you are not a born-again Christian, do not participate in this Lord's Supper today. The Scripture is very clear that to participate in this without being a Christian, to participate in an unworthy manner, 
can cause sickness and maybe even death in your life. So, if you're a born-again Christian, take the Lord's Supper. You are worthy to take it. Your, your faith in Christ and your salvation experience has made you worthy. So don't sit back there and think, well, I'm a Christian, but I still may not be worthy. No, if you're a Christian, you're worthy. Take it, okay? But if you're not a Christian, realize, I have no part in this. Uh, it, means no, it would mean nothing to me, and it could cause harm in my life. So just let it pass by uh, when it is uh, passed by. Now, before we uh, ask the, the elements to be given out, I want us to take a moment in which we just quiet ourselves before God, take a moment in prayer, uh, search our hearts and make sure that everything uh, is the way it should be between us and God, and then we'll ask the gentleman to uh, pass out the Lord's Supper. Supper be passed out now, and I would ask for you to get both the juice and the bread, and then just keep both of them until we come to a point that we can take both of them together. Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 and 24 Paul writes for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he betrayed he, would, he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me the body of Christ
verses 25 and 26. In the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of Christ. I want to thank the men that passed out the supper. I want to thank Mike for organizing that and Paul for playing. I want to thank you for being here. And I hope this has been a, a special day for you and that we have uh, been able to take communion together in a time that we normally have not done that. So uh, we'll, we'll do it again before that. Did you announce the potluck? No, I didn't. Did you announce that? I, I don't know the story. You got just August the 11th. Isn't it the 11th? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's August the 11th. Okay, August the 11th, we're going to have a potluck dinner. Okay, so bring your, your goodies. And then immediately after service, we'll have uh, we'll have the potluck dinner. <laughs> August the 11th. That's what two Sundays from now. Two Sundays from today. Okay. God bless you. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed. Okay.